This morning, I'm thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful for wonderful worship that we just got to share in together as we worship our Savior. And I'm also very thankful this morning that I didn't have to follow up Adeline Childers um, because she's way cuter than me. So I'm glad that there was at least a break in between there. But this morning, uh, I want to just share with you a story. I absolutely love um, to read stories, especially missionary stories. And uh, one of the amazing things about being a believer in Jesus Christ is that we have a long, long history of people who have sacrificed and who have given their lives for the cause of the gospel. And one of my favorite figures from history is a man named George Mueller. Some of you may be familiar with him. He was a, a Prussian citizen. He lived a very troubled youth. But uh, he was actually going to divinity school so that he could be a pastor because he thought he could have a lot of fun playing tricks on um, a congregation full of people. And eventually the Lord got a hold of his heart and called him to be a missionary. And he went to uh, England during the early part of the 1800s and just saw a huge need there. There was a cholera outbreak and he eventually was called to start an orphanage. Um, started very small with uh, just having children in his home for breakfast, eventually grew to having 30 girls in a uh, orphanage type home, and then eventually grew from there to having over 2,000 orphans at a time in a facility. It was an amazing work of God, and he said it was all through the power of prayer. There was one story in particular that one morning they woke up and they were getting ready for the day. They had a school that all of the orphans could go to for free. They fed them, uh, they closed them. They did all of the things that was required. But that morning when they woke up, they had a problem. And the problem was that there was not one penny in the bank account and there was not one scrap of food in the cupboards. It's a pretty big problem when you're trying to feed 2,000 children. And uh, George Mueller did what he did every day. He said, set the tables. So they set the tables with plates and forks and cups. Everything was empty. And he said, I'm going to pray and we're going to keep it short because I don't think God wants the kids to be late for class. Lord, provide like you always do. Amen. Shortly after, the kids were sitting there kind of murmuring, beginning, as there's empty plates and cups in front of them, and there was a knock on the door, and it was the local baker from the town of Bristol, and he came and said, I couldn't sleep last night. The Lord woke me up, and I just had this feeling like I needed to bake bread for all of the orphans. Do you think you guys could use that? And they said, I think we could probably find a use for that, right? <laughs> so he brings in tray after tray after tray of this fresh baked bread, and now the children have bread, and they uh, are now obviously very excited, and then all of a sudden there comes another knock at the door, almost right after that, and there's a milkman, and he says, listen, um, you're the only place up here. My cart's broken down. The axle is broken. And the problem is that I have hundreds of gallons of milk on the cart, and I can't fix the axle with the milk on the cart. I was wondering, do you have any strong young men who could come and help me get the milk off? In return, you guys can have the milk for free. And so in the end of just a few minutes in a simple prayer, they had bread and milk for 2,000 children. And I love stories like that because it's God who provides. And uh, George Mueller uh, has a lot of great quotes, but one of my favorite is this, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. I think that's good. And as amazing as this story is and amazing as uh, God's provision has been throughout history in so many of these situations, I think the story we read today is even more amazing. The account today of this miracle that Jesus did, it's even greater than that. It's in the book of John chapter number six. And uh, it's the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, even though that's a little bit of a misnomer when we say the feeding of the 5,000, although that's a great feat because we know from scripture that it was 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. Um, many scholars believe that the number was probably closer to 25,000 people in total. This was a huge miracle. And it's also interesting that as we get into this today, this is, with the exception of the resurrection of Jesus, the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. There's something going on here, and I think there's a lot that we can learn today. And so as we go, I just want to begin reading, if you'll read with me, in chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. We're going to see the setting of this situation. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, 
which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. So, so that we get a proper setting for this story and exactly what was going on. Um, the amazing thing about this being recorded in all four Gospels is that we get a lot of background for what's going on here. So we know that this is uh, what's happening immediately after Jesus has sent the disciples out and they have been having a season of ministry and now they are coming back to Jesus and they're all pretty tired. They're, they're tired from a season of ministry. I'm sure all of us have been in those seasons where you just kind of feel tired. You feel like you need a little bit of a break, maybe a little vacation. You're just like, this has been a really stressful season. And so we see uh, whenever this story is related in the book of Mark that Jesus is saying, okay, let's withdraw to a desolate place. Like we just need some time away from everybody. Parents, you probably understand this, right? Like you lock the bathroom door and like, don't bother me for five minutes, right? You're just trying to get just a little bit of time. And so in this situation here, Jesus and the disciples, they've just had a long season of ministry, um, doing amazing things for the kingdom of God, seeing uh, those who were sick healed, seeing miracles happen, seeing the kingdom of God and what that looks like through the King Jesus. And uh, so... This is also happening at an interesting time whenever John the Baptist has just been killed. We read that that happened just almost immediately before this. And so you can imagine that Jesus is maybe not only just physically tired, but that there's also some mourning going on there, right? I mean, Jesus described John the Baptist as the greatest among men, right? It was his, his cousin. He was the one who baptized Jesus, there was close relationship there, and so they're looking to get away to a deserted place for a few minutes, right? We can probably all understand this. You come out of a busy season, a lot of things going on, and they said, let's withdraw to a desolate place. But the fame of Jesus was such that as they were going, they couldn't get away from people. The crowds were following them. And in the book of Mark, we read that as Jesus saw these crowds that were following him, literally they were on the ocean, or not the ocean, on the Sea of Galilee. And as they were going on the Sea of Galilee, people were running along the sides of the Sea of Galilee. They were just trying to catch up to where they were going next. And so as they were running, Jesus saw them and he said, he saw that they were as sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion on them. So Jesus is now, as they're going, as they're going and trying to find a time of rest and respite, they are healing and teaching these great crowds of people that are following them. It's also accentuated by the fact that not only is it those who are following him because they've already seen what he's been doing in Judea, not only are those now following him because they see the miracles and the wonders that he's doing along the way, but now it's also, it says, the time of the Passover. So now you have thousands of pilgrims flowing in to Jerusalem. So it's just these huge crowds of people. It's like the further that they try to get away to get just a little bit of rest, it's more and more and more and more people coming. And so we can understand maybe as we read through the story and see the response of the disciples, why they might respond in this way, right? The setting is that they're tired. They're looking for rest. They just want some alone time with Jesus, right? They're like, we just need some time out into a deserted place. So as we continue to move on here now, we see that there's these great crowds of people following them as they're going, including those moving for the Passover feast. So we read next that lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? I think this is interesting too. So Jesus turns to Philip and he says, hey, where are we to buy bread? So I asked the question, I wonder why he turned to Philip. Like you don't hear a lot about Philip in the Bible, right? Like if you were to turn to, you know, uh, one of the other disciples, like James, Peter, John, we're like, oh yeah, of course he talks. About, but Philip, like, who's Philip? Well, we read in John chapter one that Philip actually is from the region of Bethsaida, so they're actually very close now to where his home is. They're right next to his hometown, and it's interesting. So Jesus asks him, "Hey, Philip, 
where can we go around here to buy bread for 25,000 people? <laughs> it's an interesting, I mean, even today, right? I mean, you'd have to hit up every Walmart in Oklahoma City, right? So it's just one of those interesting questions. He turns to Philip, he says, where are we to buy bread for these people? And it's interesting also Philip's answer because the question itself is almost so absurd that Philip actually answers a different question. He doesn't say, well, Jesus, I don't think there's a place around here that we're going to be able to make that happen. Instead, he says, listen, not, not only is there no place where we could buy bread for 25,000 people, I mean, even 5,000 people, there's nowhere where we could just be like, hey, bread for 5,000, please. Like, we can't get carry out. There's no place around here where we can do that. So he says, but Jesus, you also forget about the fact that that would cost a lot of money. He said, if we had 200 denarii worth of bread, it wouldn't be enough for even everybody to have just a little bit, just a little piece. So a denarii is a silver coin, and it's worth about a day's wage of a common working man. So you're talking about eight months of wages. In American today dollars, you're talking about $21,000 more or less. He's like, listen, Jesus, that's $21,000 worth of bread. All right, we haven't been fishing in a while. We're just kind of going and doing this thing. You know, Judas has the purse, so it's getting lighter every day. Like, we, we don't have really the money to be able to be buying bread, even if there was a place to buy bread. We understand maybe the pragmatism there, right? Like, whenever Jesus asks us to do things, and we say, yeah, but Jesus, do you not know our situation? Have you not seen the economy, Jesus? Have you heard of this thing called inflation? Like, is now really the time to be doing all of these things, Jesus? But I love that as we read there, it says that he turned to Philip and asked that, but he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So we see Philip's skepticism here. Jesus, you're asking an completely ridiculous, impossible question. Like, where can we get bread for this people? How would we pay for the bread, even if there was such a place to get the bread? Jesus. And then we see that uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are those among so many? You got to give Andrew at least points for trying, right? Like they're going out through, through the crowd and they're looking. As we read earlier in the, in the book of Mark, you can see that actually Jesus and his disciples, they got off without eating themselves. So they were in such haste to get off. So they haven't eaten. Uh, these people haven't eaten. They're going out through the crowds like, who's got some fish? Who's got some food? Anybody? And this guy, I mean, whenever we read that he's got five loaves, these aren't like, you know, loaves. These barley loaves, it's more like he's got tuna fish and crackers, which also, why do we call it tuna fish but not chicken bird? I don't know. But he's got like tuna and crackers. That's his lunch, right? And he's like, listen, we've got this boy. He's got some crackers. He's got some fish. But what are we going to do with that? What is that among so many? I think that whenever we see these things, we can relate with them, right? Maybe in this season of life, at least for me, I know that it's easy to feel tired. It's easy whenever Jesus then calls us to do something in the middle of our tiredness that seems impossible. We're thinking, Jesus, do you not know what you're asking? That's a ridiculous question. Planting a church after COVID? <laughs> Why? Have you looked at our giving statements? Have you looked at our economy? Don't you know that we're in a post-Christian America, Jesus? Don't you see all of these things? Why, why would we do this? And it's not just about church planting. It's about so many things in our lives. Don't we respond in this way? Jesus, you would have me to do this? You would have me to support missions? Have you seen our budget? You would have me to give time in the nursery? I'm not good with kids. You've seen me do all of these different things and Jesus calls us and he gives us the opportunity to trust him. He gives us the opportunity to put ourselves in situations where we say it has to be you because it can't be me. 
And those are terrifying situations. But those are thrilling situations. Could you imagine being the disciples and sitting there if they had said, Jesus, there's no place to buy bread. There's no money to buy bread. But we've got you, and that's all we need. So we see Andrew at least tries, and he says, what are these among so many? As we continue, starting in verse number 10, we see, and Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took then the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. It's amazing, and we know again from the other gospels, specifically in Matthew and Mark, that during this story, the disciples said, Jesus, we should send these people away into the towns that are surrounding so that they can be able to buy something to eat. It's a compassionate statement, right? Like, Jesus, these people are hungry, we're hungry, let's make sure that they get something to eat, it's getting late, let's send them away. And Jesus says in the book of Mark and Matthew, you give them something to eat. And again, they look at themselves and they say, how am I supposed to do this, Jesus? How am I supposed to give them something to eat? The, the money, the places to buy bread. We've got nothing here. How are we supposed to do it? And Jesus is looking for faith. Jesus is looking for the faith of saying, well, if you tell me to give them something to eat, I guess I'll give them something to eat. I don't know how but we'll figure it out. And Jesus, whenever he has everyone sit down, blesses the crackers, he blesses the fish, and everyone eats as much as they want. And then they go around and they pick up all of the fragments, and there's even more than they started with. It's an amazing miracle. It's the scale of this miracle is bigger than anything that we've seen up to this point in Jesus' ministry. He has healed people. He has done things in a one-on-one situation. He's done things in a public setting. But thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people eating from practically nothing, from one little boy's lunch, and they were able to all eat And this is a true miracle, and I know we live today in a day of skepticism, and you may read some commentaries or read some comments that said, no, 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 what Jesus did was that as everyone sat down, the little boy offering his lunch that touched people's hearts so deeply, and they all decided to reach into their knapsacks and into their satchels and pull out food, and they all shared, and they had a lovely shared meal. But that's not what happened. It's like, I remember um, growing up, there's those little readers, you know, where you would read through the practice stories and everything. There was this, a story called Stone Soup, and there was a man who came into town, and it was a town that seemed very poor, and nobody ever had enough to eat, and he told them that he knew a secret recipe to make soup, and he could make it with just some rocks, and everybody obviously was so excited, you can make soup out of rocks, and so he got there, and he put some stones and some boiling water, and he said, oh man, but you know what goes so well with stone soup? If only we had some carrots. And somebody said, oh, I might have a couple of carrots, and then somebody said, oh, if only we had some potatoes. Well, you know, I might just have a couple of potatoes. So if, oh, if only, and so eventually everybody came, and they brought all of their things together, and everybody ate the soup. Isn't it a lovely story, but that's not what's happening here. That's not what's happening here. It's not that Jesus is encouraging people to share and that's what's happening. No, no, no. Instead, he is doing a regenerative miracle. Every time he breaks off a piece of the bread, there is more bread to be had. Every time he breaks off a piece of the fish, there is more fish to be had. And how do we know this? Well, let's just see the response of the crowd to what happened. As we go here, we're going to read in verse now, number 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet 
who has come into the world. I mean, they lost their minds. They was like, wow, this guy just fed thousands of people from a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. And then they said, this is the prophet who has come into the world. So again, in the Jewish understanding, this isn't just some prophet. This isn't just some guy. No, this is Deuteronomy chapter 18. Whenever Moses is giving the people instructions before he is going to leave them. And he says, but there's going to come another prophet who is like me. There's going to come another prophet and he will only speak what the Lord tells him to speak. This prophet is coming. So don't get distracted. Don't follow false gods. Don't fall into witchcraft and idolatry. Wait for this prophet. And this is the prophet that now they are recognizing Jesus to be. And rightfully so, because whenever they were in the wilderness under Moses, what did they eat? Manna that came from heaven, bread from the hand of God himself. And now on this desolate mountaintop, what did they eat? Bread from the hand of God himself. They're recognizing that this is the prophet. This is more than just a, hey, this guy got us all to share. He must be a great guy. No, this is, this guy just did the impossible the outlandish, the absolutely insane, the way that there is no human way for him to be able to accomplish this task. He just did it. He's the prophet. He's the Messiah. And so what is their response to this revelation? Well, Jesus says that he perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. They were so impressed by what Jesus had done. They were so awe-inspired. They said, this has to be the one that we've been waiting for. But then what's their response to that? Is their response to fall down on their knees and say, you truly are the Messiah. What would you have us do? No, their response is, let's take him by force and make him our king. Our king in our way. We want to set him up now over our nation so that he can lead us into this new promised land, right? He's just done something that no human means could accomplish. And now they want to come back in with human means to make him their king in a human way. We see now that they have fallen into the temptation that Jesus overcame whenever he was in the wilderness, the temptation of Satan that says, I will make you king over all of these lands if you only bow down to me. And now all of the people say, let's make him king in the way that we want him to be king, in the human way, in the conquering way. Couldn't he feed such a great army with being able to make so much bread? And so what does Jesus do? He withdraws from them. He's just done such an amazing miracle. He has shown compassion to these people, even in the midst of being tired, even in the midst of a busy season, even in the midst of the doubt of his disciples. He does this amazing work. He feeds thousands of people from his very hand. And their response, we could use this guy. We can make this guy work for us. We can be great if we set this guy up. And isn't that another trap that we fall into? To try to make Jesus useful for us, for our agendas, for our way to make ourselves great, to build something that we can say, oh, I go to this church, don't we have so many amazing people? Look at all of our fancy technology, mm, isn't this great? We want to find all of these different ways to say, look at all of these things that we have, look at how we've used Jesus to build these things, and yet, if we look at Jesus, he's not building kingdoms around us, he's building kingdoms around himself. He's building the kingdom of God. And again, these traps over and over again that we see just falling through here, whenever Jesus is doing the impossible to multiply the ministry and the work of God, and yet so many times, if we're not careful, we can get in the way. And this is a message to myself as much as to anybody else, because as you all know, this is um, 
our last Sunday here at Metropolitan Bible Church. If you didn't know that, sorry, spoiler alert, but <laughs> we're getting ready to go out and to launch a new church. And as exciting as it is and as terrifying as it is, the thing that is the most pressing on my heart is, God, your glory and not our glory. And I'm so thankful for Metropolitan Bible Church that you all have said the same, your glory, not our glory. We don't want to just build a big church. We don't want to just have more people and say, look at us, but we want to multiply ministry. And that's what church planting is. It's multiplication. And in some ways, it seems like the most impractical way of doing anything in the world. Wait, so you're saying that we're going to send out people, we're going to send out funding, we're going to maybe what the world would consider get smaller, and in some ways that's going to enlarge the kingdom? How does that work? That just seems crazy. That's not pragmatic. That goes against every church growth strategy I've ever read in my life. How can we possibly do these things? Because Jesus takes what seems small and insignificant and almost laughable. A couple of loaves, a couple of fish, thousands of people. <laughs> Makes no sense. And if he uses it and he multiplies it and somehow he grows it so that God gets the glory. And that's not just true about church planting. That's true in every area of our life. God consistently calls us to areas that don't make sense. It's not pragmatic, Jesus. It doesn't make a lot of financial sense to do this. It doesn't make a lot of... I mean, can't we just wait until later whenever things are better? Jesus, can't we just get a little bit of rest before you try to bring all of these people who need ministry? Just send these people away and let them go take care of themselves. Can't you see, Jesus, that we're dealing with our own stuff here? And it is such a trap that we can get caught up in to say, all we have is what we have. We have this limited mindset of like, as we send stuff out, now we have less. And Jesus says, as you put things in my hand, you always have enough. And that is such an encouragement for me as we move into the season of church planting, because as you know, church planters, um, we don't have a ton of money. <laughs> so we might have just a little bit of money and just a few people, and it might be laughable just meeting in a room together and believing that God would do something with that. But when we place it in the hands of the Savior, he does something incredible. He does the impossible. He does things that in the human eye would seem laughable. And he makes them incredible. And so we see that when these people seek to now use Jesus for their own way, when they seek to go and to buy force, which I always just, that's so interesting that they wanted to go and take Jesus by force. Like, we're going to make you do this, Jesus. Like, <laughs> this guy just fed 5,000 people, 25,000 people. He's healed people. Like, you literally saw the Spirit of God descend from heaven upon him. The voice of God saying, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. And you think you can force him to be your king? <laughs> I mean, that's laughable, right? But you read it there that they were going to try to take him by force and be like, yes, we're going to make you be our king. Like, it's, it's a laughable thing, but man, we do the same thing sometimes. And so now we see in this next portion of scripture how ridiculous that is 
So as we read through, again, the full complement of all of the Gospels telling the story, it says that Jesus urged his disciples, he commanded them to leave. So this miracle happened in the late evening, or the late afternoon, and now it is going to evening, it is becoming dark, and Jesus sends his disciples away across the sea as he is going to withdraw to the mountain to pray. You kind of get the sense that all of these people now, they're getting excited, they're thinking, we're going to take him by force, and he knows his disciples, and he loves them, but man, they're knuckleheads sometimes. So he's like, I don't want you guys to get caught up in this. Go across the sea. I'm going to dismiss this crowd. I'm going to go and pray. And we see that as the disciples are now going across the sea, that when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Again, so you have this group of people who think, oh, we could take Jesus by force, we could do this. He sends them away, and then what do we see? He has power to walk on water. He has power over the wind and the waves themselves. And then what does he do? He gets in the boat with the disciples, and what does it say? Immediately, they were at the place where they were going. So from where they were at to Capernaum was about five miles at least by sea. It says that they had rowed three to four miles. So they were at least a mile away whenever they saw Jesus walking on the water. And they're rowing hard. They're rowing as hard as they can. I don't know if you guys have ever been on the rowing machine like at peak, you know, revs, and then you're trying to row. Now, can you imagine actually doing that in a boat, rowing for your life, trying not to die? Like, it's pretty stressful, right? So, I mean, a mile is a long way to go in those conditions. And yet, when Jesus gets in the boat with them, what happens? They're there. That place that seemed like it was going to be impossible to get to all of a sudden, whenever Jesus got in the boat with them, he moved them there. So this Jesus, again, who they were trying to bend their will, we see the next verse, that he has power over the water, the waves, the wind, and even space and time itself. He shows the supremacy of his person. And this is absolutely amazing to me as we look through all of these different things and and so much of this, and John's going to talk a little bit about this next week, but just mirrors the children of Israel and their wanderings in the desert. As Jesus comes up to the boat, what does he say? It is I, or literally in the Greek, I am. He's saying, it's all right. God's with you in the boat now. It's all going to be all right. So as we look at this, I think what we see over and over and over again is that God doesn't traffic in the possible. Whenever God calls us to a work, he's not saying, now you guys check your schedules, crunch the numbers, get five or six or eight committees together to really make sure that we've got this all worked out. And if you guys agree that this is something that we should do, then we should go ahead and make that happen. But instead, Jesus says, this is what I've called you to. Are you going to have faith in me to do it? This is what I've called you to. Feed these people. And will our response be like the disciples of, but God, what about the money? But God, where are we supposed to do all this stuff? But God, what about, what about, what about? Or will we say, Okay, Jesus, I mean, we got you, so you're going to make it happen. I don't understand how, but you're going to do it. And we live in a very pragmatic and a very practical world, and that is okay in some ways. But I think in some ways it draws our heart away from the miracles and the miraculous power of Jesus. Sometimes we kind of 
work Jesus out of our equation, right? We say, whenever we get enough money, we're going to start this next program. Whenever we get enough people, then we're going to do this. Whenever we get out of this season, then we can move to the next thing. And yet Jesus is saying, go into all the world, making disciples of all nations. And yet Jesus is saying, love those who are unloved. And yet Jesus is saying, preach the gospel. And we can work our way into a billion different reasons for why that doesn't make sense in our lives right now. We can work ourselves into a hundred thousand reasons of why that's not practical. We can work ourselves up into a frenzy and make ourselves believe that we're the ones in the right because well, if God knew the situation, which obviously he does, he wouldn't want me to do that anyways, right? And we can let the realities of this world distract us from the power of the presence of Christ. Because honestly, without him, we can do nothing. But with him, we can do all things. And that's the encouragement that I want to give you all today. And that's what I want to thank you for is because I know that it is a big ask to plant a church. I know that in some ways that is seeming like the absolute worst thing that you could do at the absolute worst time in history. But God calls us to go out into the world and to preach the gospel. And you Metropolitan Bible Church have answered that call and you've done it so well and we felt so loved and supported in doing it. And again, preaching this message to myself, remembering that next week, whenever we go with just a few people in a room with a whole bunch of mirrors at the YMCA, <laughs> and it's gonna seem like, God, you're using this for your glory? God, you're, you're gonna do something with this? that's going to make your name great. And we believe that he will, not because we have the money for the bread, not because we have the places to even buy the bread, but because he is the bread. And when we believe that, I think that ignites our hearts to be faithful in ministry where we're at, to be faithful in starting new ministries in new places, to give sacrificially, in different ways to see the kingdom of God advance. And that is a beautiful thing. But we can only do it when we keep Jesus at the center of all we do. We can't do it without him. And I think that is the true essence of humility, not God, I can't do this, but God, I can't do this without you. And so would we all humbly today submit ourselves to say, Lord, Whatever you call us to, we're going to have faith that you can do it. Whatever you call us to, regardless of how difficult or how seemingly easy, how exciting or how mundane, if you call us to it, we'll do it. Because it's you who's working through us. So thank you, Metropolitan Bible Church, for the last, uh, I mean, while we've been working here 20 months, while we've been coming here almost three years now, for the love and support that you've given us. Thank you for putting your faith in Christ that even whenever things don't make sense, he makes sense of them. Thank you for not pushing Jesus out of the boat and trying to conform him into the boxes that we sometimes have of what it looks like to have the biggest and the best so that we look great. But instead of saying, Lord, we want to make you great and trusting him to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful because it is you who does the work. Lord, we barely even have a couple of crackers and some fish. We have a laughable amount to give. And yet, when we give even the small amount that we have, and we place that into your hands, somehow, you take that and you turn it into something beautiful. You multiply that to see the salvation of those who are far from you, to see the healing of those who have been broken, to see those who are so 
trapped in deep darkness to see the light of your word. And it's all because you are who you say you are, not because you are who we try to make you into or who we try to fit you into some kind of box, Lord, but whenever we open our hands with what we have and we put it in tears, that you do great things that only you can do. So we praise you and we ask you, Lord, that you would continue to do that through Metropolitan Bible Church, through Gather Community Church, all for your glory in your church now and forever. To your name we pray, amen.